While it's the average number of years that we hopefully enjoy in our life is increasing, the age, the average age of onset of the first chronic disease is actually getting younger and younger. So we are not living longer, we're actually dying for longer. We're getting sick earlier and we're then carrying that chronic disease through for the rest of our careers. The irony is that the younger you are, the more sleep you require. It's the older we get, the less sleep physiologically our bodies need. I have been obsessed with mitochondria now since 2006. We have five key forms, aerobic, anaerobic, strength, flexibility and balance. If you're not sleeping and recovering correctly, you're not going to be able to excel in that movement paradigm. Science and data is also suggestive that exposure to cold improves your immune system. Outside of your brain, the part of the body which has the second highest concentration of neurons is your gut. Marcus Rene is one of those fascinating people you meet in your life who has worked with everybody from astronauts to people in the Air Force to he's literally gone to the Arctic Circle not just once, he's planned to go again. He's worked in the front lines during COVID-19. He's worked extensively on pushing human performance and he says that most human beings can now live up to 120 years deep scientific evidence on the kind of experimentations and biohacks that will get you there. So going to tap into all of that knowledge on this episode of Take a Pause. But before we go there, I want to make sure hit subscribe and smash that bell icon going straight into my chat with Marcus Rennie. If I had had this chat with you let's say three years ago, I, I, I think I'd have a very different set of questions because I didn't look at health the same way as I do now. I don't look at human performance the same way as I do now. And I was going to be, as you're putting notes down, there's something that pops up in your Twitter bio, which I'm sure you're asked about a lot, which is that humans can live to 120. Mm. And something which I say a lot from a book which I read, it's that the average human life is 4,000 weeks, which is the whole thing about how do you optimize for time. Yeah. I want to ask you, at which point did the focus on longevity become something that kind of drilled down upon a lot more? Yeah, I think um, longevity is a word which has, in fact, just this morning I was reading a report out in the US press about the number of times the word longevity has featured month on month in the US media over the last um, uh, 12 or 16 quarters. And it's just sort of skyrocketed up. And um, there's obviously been a lot more concentration and, and focus on this area from very notable angel investors and startup entrepreneurs that have sort of begun to back the space. But for me, honestly, Varun, longevity is not as one would think about it from the lens of number of years one lives. I know my Twitter bio has that, yeah. but it's 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 also a little bit of a, a hook there for people mm, yeah. to, to at least put a... Clickbait done right. Clickbait <laughs> done right, yeah. Uh, see, I learned from folks. Um, <laughs> but uh, for me, the biggest irony, uh, the dichotomy, actually probably one of the saddest things about the world we live in today is that whilst the average number of years that we hopefully enjoy in our life is increasing, the age, the average age of onset of the first chronic disease is actually getting younger and younger. So we are not living longer we're actually dying for longer. We're getting sick earlier and we're then carrying that chronic disease through for the rest of our careers. So as a physician, I fell out of love with day-to-day -day medical practice because it was just too focused on pathogenesis and disease. And I have always been someone who've enjoyed this human frame, enjoyed the great outdoors, enjoyed understanding what happens to the body in extreme environments. And so my thesis is how can we bring, translate that science to all of our everyday lives so that our health span coefficient or those number of healthy years actually increases and thereby hopefully then increasing the number of years as well. But if we're just living longer but suffering through it, then there's very little joy or purpose in that. So that's sort of where I come at when it comes to this equation. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that, right? Because there's been a lot of talk about how people are living longer, but this whole point of view, we're dying longer actually is something to happen to because the belief is that people seem to be looking at their health a lot more. Um, you suddenly have so much conversation around, everyone wants to understand um, metrics, right? You want to know what your sleep data is like, you want to figure out 
I mean, you have people walking around with the, with the sensors to, um, you know, kind of doing that. But at the basic level, while there's a lot of data there, there's also the the problem of are we looking at the data and not really getting what we should get from it? Um, because we suddenly have like an abundance of it and getting more and more of that. So at at the base level, if 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 someone's looking at the data, what are the things for you to be able to a just perform better in life, but also to be able to focus on the right areas if there were pillars we have to focus on what would those pillars be so i think the coming to your data point the last statistic i read was somewhere in the region that each of us is creating about 2 megabytes of data a second and that data being used by a variety of sources to either recommend something we shouldn't eat someone we shouldn't date something we shouldn't watch etc etc so i think it's fascinating that we can now live in a world where hopefully we can use that data to actually live longer and better through the process um for me it's simple i call it the the great pentagon of health and well-being there are five key pillars the first is sleep i think that is the fundamental aspect whether it's health longevity or performance one must invest in sleep the second is fueling the body and i purposefully use the word fuel and not diet fuel to me is because we're a machine and what you put in is important for what you get out so that will include aspects like macronutrients micronutrients supplementation hydration caffeination etc uh the microbiome and things like this the third aspect is then how you move the body again purposefully using the word movement and not exercise because one can enjoy movement in so many ways irrespective of disabilities or differently abled folks and we have five key forms aerobic anaerobic strength flexibility and balance and that increasingly the the ratio changes as we get older in life then for me the fourth is the environment which are the people places and technologies that we are surrounded by and the fifth is our mood mental and emotive state um so that's how i view this equation and then looking at different levers to then uh rebalance in an individual to their for them to be optimized i like the fact that you said pentagon and not like separate pillars because the tendency is always to say these are pillars of your health but when you say pentagon you almost saying that they all kind of they're all, they're all connected, connected and they connect in this particular order as well because if you for example if um having just run the marathon last week if i wanted to work towards running a marathon say i was a, a new we were just talking about yeah. running right say your goal for next year is to is to run a, a half marathon or a marathon right so you can set yourself out with a particular set of objectives to achieve in your physical lens through a movement perspective but if you're not fueling the body correctly if you're not sleeping and recovering correctly you're not going to be able to excel in that movement paradigm so that's that connection or for um, a business leader uh someone who's having to make important decisions every day for long periods of time you may want to work on your mood and emotion but if you haven't even slept well then all of us appreciate just how agitated frustrated unempathetic disconnected we are to the rest of the world so that's going to clearly affect our mood and emotive state and therefore decision making ability to empathize and connect with people so it's exactly as you said it's it's not individual pillars that connected and they connect in a particular order or series for us to get to where we want to go i want to bring up sleep um i think for today for me it's a lot more relevant because i haven't slept well and the tendency is for all of us and i have this conversation a lot with um people who are entrepreneurs today um, because i remember that when i was a uh, first time entrepreneur for me it was about stay awake all night get about four about five odd hours of sleep and then kind of run to work and at some point that crash happens in a week to 10 days um the co- common analogy of i'll sleep when i'm dead um you know, uh, you know stuff like that and but that is almost like the starting point of nothing else matters if you don't get sleep right i want to tap into sleep and saying that and people also believe when i'm younger i can sleep lesser and get away with it i want to understand other ramifications in the long term that happen even if, even in your 20s and i feel that's the category where you sleep the least because you believe you can get away with it um it still kind of spirals towards a later point in life the irony is that the younger you are the more sleep you require it's the older we get the less sleep physiologically our bodies need so sleep is critical whether it's performance entrepreneurship being a corporate athlete 
uh, or you know just being a, a parent uh, as you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you are which is we where the sleep are. went off right exactly yeah, yeah. I, I parenting is life's way of teaching us how to get by with little sleep um but uh, it's a, it's a passing phase yeah but uh, yeah I, i you know it's 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 absolutely critical we we have to invest in it we have to make sure we're getting the right amount um because whether it's one's physical health and the ability for the cardiovascular system for the musculoskeletal system to recover whether it's one's cognitive abilities i.e. focus concentration memory sleep is important there or whether it's your psychological and emotional state sleep is critically important there as well so allowing your body the right amount because you know i evolution is is a science which is very smart in that anything which is disadvantages to the organism or doesn't really have any role to play i can only think of really the appendix which is still there and even there it's probably there because of the microbiome to some degree but otherwise the human body is so good at getting rid of excess not just our body all organisms within the natural world but sleep is something we find critical across the animal kingdom and in fact if you look at some of the scientific literature there are also indications that the plant kingdom may actually be having its own period of rest at particular times so rest and recovery and sleep being therefore the medium is something that we each need to prioritize and that's why i like to start on that topic yeah. why brought up sleep also was because feel what happens is that when people all also believe and i think there's a misnomer when you think about biohacking right people believe you can get away with less sleep and do other things just by but i want to kind of take away some of the misconceptions we have in saying that how do you define biohacking especially in context of it's not something you can it's not a supplementation it's it's more an enhancement right, right. right no absolutely i think biohacking exists in a spectrum from uh, sort of genetic alterations on one side um st- whole body stem cell transplantations expensive pellets funky fancy clinics in high mountainous areas uh, all the way through for me actually biohacking is much simpler than that um we have a great degree of agency when it comes to the trajectory of our health and lifespan our commonly held misnomer or fallacy is that and i often hear this with my patients is that they say oh doc it's just because i'm indian or it's because of who my parents and grandparents are and it's on in our dna if you look at the equation that that translate in terms of number of years lived the rough proportion contribution from your genetic material alone i.e. the actual coding of atgc which is in your dna makes anywhere between 16 to 18% and that's more important when it comes to specific disease states and you carrying a gene or having a certain set of genes which may make you more prone to that the rest of that uh, side which is about 80 82% is actually down to the environment the choices you make in life and the people and the work that you do so that means that we have a much greater degree of agency of control versus what we think is our baggage in our dna Now these three things define or can alter the genetic component there's something called epigenetics which is the transcription of genes and therefore that leads to what we call then phenotype which is then the physical representation of what that means biologically but ultimately therefore we have the control and so for me it was always about not expensive therapies funky equipment that's nice and cool to do but to democratize this message we have to be in a space that anyone anywhere can be prescribed the lifestyle intervention that she needs in order to optimize herself today so that that trajectory of health and lifespan also improves in the process and these are the simple things they're not easy but they're simple things around us for each of us yeah and i i know that you believe in the fact that for anyone to do these things and, and i'm just we pulled out of something which you've said is that you can't treat what you can't measure yeah um how do you measure aspects of yourself so you can enhance it um be it around and not just around like let's say sleep and 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 food because we measure food we yeah but are there things that we actually should be measuring which we don't realize that we should um on a, on a on a general basis so i think 
we can divide measurements into objective and subjective, right? The objective measurements are actual data points that relate to either a particular input, like how many hours of sleep you got, or a particular outcome, which could be your heart rate variability, which is sort of a surrogate for stress, right? And then there are subjective measurements where one can ask an individual, well, okay, you may have slept seven hours last night, input metric, but did you wake up today feeling refreshed and energized and ready to take on the world, right? That's a very subjective thing. But it's equally important for us each to ask ourselves that question. Because if the answer to the latter is no and the former is yes, then something about the former is not right. Either the quantity or the quality or the environment or the context or the, something was not right about that. And that will allow us to fine tune this model, this algorithm that runs in each of our heads every day to then allow us to understand, well, therefore, what should I be doing in order for me to feel well-rested and energized? Because if you are feeling well-rested and energized and last night was only a six-hour input, then maybe for you, as we are all existing on a bell-shaped distribution, then maybe that is enough for your physiological state. And this rule of thumb that we apply generally seven to nine hours you may actually fall more in the spectrum of the six to seven hours of that, of that aspect, right? So that's why I think it's really important from a data perspective that we ask ourselves, and if there's an objective measurement of a tool and we have the ability to access and afford it, then fantastic. But if we can't, there are still questions that we can ask ourselves to try and figure out what the right framework of life should be to get to where we want to be optimally. And just take that a step ahead, what have you seen are things people are most interested in, in optimizing, which at some point also become vanity metrics, right? Um, that's, I mean, I, like I remember the other day, I, I started sleep tracking because I've got, you have the watch, it's doing that, let's try this one out. And I'm talking about, oh, I got more REM sleep today than yesterday. And at some point, like, what is that for? And then start to read up about it. It almost, and... I've realized that everybody who started to wear those sensors, uh, like I've had friends who've, who've done entire conversations around, Right. Um, I don't react as badly to pizza as I thought I would. Right. I actually react badly to healthy food. Right? Right. You know, so uh, people are picking the data, uh, it's standard human yeah. scenario, right? you're picking yeah. the data with yeah. a very clear focus about you want to prove something which is a hypothesis of yours. Yeah. But what are you seeing as, okay, you're not proving anything by picking these things, but what people are really trying to do. So selection bias is exactly what you're saying. The other thing which I find fascinating is that old proverb, which is the man looking for the key and someone walks past and he says, well, did you lose it here? He says, no, I lost it over there, yeah. but I'm looking here because the light is shining on this part, right? So I think that's another aspect as sensor technologies, like as you're describing, this blood glucose monitoring patch yeah. has become much more available and accessible. Now suddenly everyone jumps on that bandwagon and it might not be something that everyone needs to do, frankly. There's a specific use case or use cases which will unlock the most advantage uh, from that uh, perspective. But where I take great joy is that through the pandemic, for whatever reason, many reasons perhaps, this conversation about health and wellness and how much we prioritize and most importantly invest has clearly been elevated, right? We have each individually uh, our teams and at a systemic level appreciated just what a critical role our health plays in society. And so people are now more naturally curious. Uh, content is much more freely available. Um, and technologies have become increasingly commoditized. So that allows us to sit in a world where data or biology and technology can come together and we can have some fun through that process as well. And you, you've had a journey through the pandemic as well, um, coming on to what you're setting up now. Um, I'd love for you to kind of talk about this journey for you becoming an entrepreneur in this space as well yeah so as i was sharing with you before we sat here it was completely serendipitous i never set out life thinking i wanted to become an entrepreneur no one goes to med school thinking i'm going to become an entrepreneur one day um it would be a very expensive waste of money otherwise um but when the pandemic started like many other clinicians i decided the right thing for me to do was to go back to frontline medicine something i hadn't done in, a, in over a decade since i left the uk uh, and I think for me, that will always, I hope, remain the most purposeful work that I ever did. Um, these are the days before we had masks available, RT-PCR testing. So my job in, in, in society was about identifying prospective patients who are suffering from COVID-19 and then managing them in, in the community. Unfortunately, however, the first wave I contracted the original virus strain 
and in days where we didn't have many available medications i became very unwell and it took me a long time to recover and it was through that process of recovery physically and mentally that something in me became introspective to ask myself the question that what do i really want to do in this phase this next emerging phase of my life and my career and given that my main love and passion in life is science i thought i i need to go back to science and i i want to go back to bringing biology back into the core central piece of my work and with the sort of headwinds around the way the world was changing with how it looked at health and wellness this very organically began the journey which leads me to where we are today where human edge as a longevity science company is really looking at how we can integrate biology and technology to optimize and elevate each of our lives we've very specifically been focused on people at work um for a variety of of sort of business reasons um but the intelligence that we're building which is this ability to absorb data all kinds of data blood data digital data lifestyle data environmental data non health data to appreciate and build what that individual's profile really is and then provide that lifestyle intervention timely based on her objective and her environment and context so that she can have the best possible day from a health perspective is the journey that we we're, we're going out towards so so that's that's sort of a little bit about the journey yeah. that we're doing yeah and and also start off um, with with your book which which I enjoyed reading also because you're talking about the the way humans can perform at at a level which we might not even scratch the surface on right the fact that you recovered from pneumonia recently and have also been able to run a marathon but i actually want to ask you about what you did right after the marathon is is the blood test which i was very intrigued by i'm like i have to ask marcus about this so that yeah finish the marathon and you kind of you you did this specific experiment where you got people to donate blood what is that about i have been obsessed with mitochondria now since 2006 that I is mean, not a sentence i've heard many people say i know i know and it it's a sentence that my wife will always cringe at <laughs> so much so that in 2007 for halloween while i was at med school i actually um uh, 2005 i actually dressed up as captain mitochondria i i created i know you're a fan of batman i created <laughs> my own superhero avatar captain mitochondria and i dressed up and uh, that that outfit still exists today as well somewhere um so mitochondria is something that i've obsessed over so much so that the penultimate chapter of my book was dedicated to mitochondria really from a lens of the next frontier of medicine and i say that because we probably our listeners will will maybe remember and recollect from their high school uh, school uh, biology days that mitochondria is this tiny organelle that sits in practically every cell type except the red cell red blood cell which is responsible for creating energy and energy is the spark of life without the energy the cell can't do its function now over the last sort of 15 20 years there has been a increasingly amount of appreciation for energy production from a sport and a human performance and that's how i discovered it part of an expedition to mount everest where we were looking at physiological adaptations to low oxygen hypoxia and what is going on in the body cells that allow us to propel ourselves to frankly not only exist but <coughs> even survive on the summit of mount everest which has an oxygen concentration roughly a third what we are enjoying right now at sea level whereas if i took the same individual and suddenly had them at on the intensive care unit at the same oxygen concentration or even even a double dose of that they would probably cease to survive in a matter of minutes so there's clearly something there and that's the story that we were looking at in understanding and central to that was that there was an adaptation at the mitochondrial level which was allowing it to burn oxygen differently so i i got hooked i got obsessed with this little thing and over the last many years it it has somehow creeped up in other spheres of areas that i got involved with whether it was space flight and sending you know preparing to send men and women to to moon and mars and beyond and what is the role of mitochondria in muscle energetics principally because in a low gravity environment your muscle and bones don't have the stimulus and therefore we atrophy etc etc but why is it important from a longevity coming back to your first question in a health span is that 
Imagine I'm a mitochondria that's sitting inside the beta cell of a pancreas, right? The beta cell of the pancreas, it has one role. Its role is to secrete insulin into the bloodstream when glucose levels are detected to be high. If the mitochondria are not producing enough energy, that beta cell is becoming sluggish. It is not secreting the right timely amount of insulin. This is the beginnings of what will eventually lead to insulin resistance and therefore diabetes. If it's a mitochondria in the cardiac myocyte of the heart, and the heart cell's function is to contract and therefore in a rhythmic way propel blood to the rest of the body, if the mitochondria in the heart cell isn't functioning properly, then that heart cell, that cardiac myocyte becomes sluggish, it doesn't beat in the same rhythm as the rest of them, and that's the beginning for, for cardiac conditions, etc. So we have now seen that almost in every major chronic disease, from cardiovascular health to metabolic health to neurodegenerative disorders, uh, 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 musculoskeletal disorders, etc. Mitochondria maladaptation or mitochondria going bad or going wrong is one of the central tenets to aging. So I really believe that in the next 10, 12 years, we are increasingly going to see molecules, interventions, therapies, and diagnostics which will help us understand the mitochondria in real time better and therefore hopefully help us optimize it through the process. And all the stuff we talk about today, which have become sexy trends, whether it's intermittent fasting, whether it's uh, cold water immersion, um, supplementation like NAD plus and uh, sirtuins, et cetera, they all have an effect somewhere down the line on mitochondrial bioenergetics. So the blood test that we did, which is the first time it's ever been done in India, is really translating a research tool, which is a mass spectrometry tool, which looks at electron signatures in tiny metabolites. These are, these are molecules which are, well, actually they're smaller than molecules. They exist in the blood, but they are tiny atoms which are linked together. And what our objective is, partnering with the Indian Institute of Technology here in Mumbai, is that could we see a signature signal difference in the way the mitochondria have worked themselves in a period of exhaustion, i.e. running a marathon, between number one, runners who've done the half marathon versus the full marathon. So is there a signal difference between that? Number two, runners who ran faster or more efficiently versus runners who did slowly. And then retrospectively, could we then, because we did a baseline measurement 24 hours before we started the race ourselves, could we see a difference or a predictive difference, therefore, going forward in a signature status at baseline? And the reason why this is interesting beyond the academic nature of hopefully understanding the mitochondria itself better is imagine now I'm a weekend warrior, a weekend athlete, and I'm now, you are now training for a run next year. Could we be able to be in a position to do a test on you to get a nice baseline to understand not just how fast you can run a 5K on a treadmill, which is macro uh, cardiovascular endurance, but can we even look at the mitochondrial activity and then work with that individual by either fueling differently or recovering differently or strategizing biohacks differently so that the mitochondria itself is in a more optimal state. So it's a very future forward looking idea. Uh, the science, the, the testing technology exists. And so we thought, hey, why not? Uh, get this going. So we, we've got a just a very small handful of runners who've self-volunteered for this, but I'm really, really excited as are the professors who are working with us to see what could potentially come of it. I think about medical science and I, and I grew up in a family of doctors. And at some point, I also think about the fact that if we'd actually learned about a lot of the things we now learn, weirdly enough, online, um, through podcasts, through uh, stuff, we actually learned a lot of this stuff even at a broad level in schools I think the fascination towards it would have been far higher and un maybe the understanding would have been far better because I feel the tendency has always been that okay this is something I won't get but when you're talking about it, you're talking about it as an actionable insight you know this is this is this is what this can actually do versus this is the sum of the parts and this is you know either we went too macro or we didn't go actionable enough as we seeing experiments like this happen like what you've just done and, and 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 more of this happening if i would like fast forward to the future part of just add on to what you just said what do you see human beings doing in a in a, in a, in a day in their lives that will not just improve the 
how long they live but the quality of how they live what all do you see them kind of doing i think the ingredients will be common place and for us at least as a company our thesis is on these five interconnected pillars the way we've tried to go about executing on this interesting problem is that there is clearly a library for that ingredients right you take the same um i often talk about it in terms of culinary right if you take the same set of cooking ingredients you could make chinese food on one hand indian food on the other european cuisines etc so we each have different objectives and outcomes some of us may be more inclined towards athletic performance some of us may want to have greater focus and concentration some of us frankly may be in a state that we're pre diabetic or having fatty liver and we may just want to start to address that before it becomes a a bigger challenge so how we're looking at this problem is that if there is an ingredient set which exists what can we do as the intelligence to advise the individual which of these ingredients is the most appropriate for you to be doing today and the analogy that that you mentioned which is something that we think is really interesting is is what does that ideal 24 hour look like from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed some things are beyond your control but a lot of things are actually under our control or rather even if they're beyond the con- our control we could still do it in a different manner to achieve something and some simple things for our listeners might be we may not have control over how many meetings we have in the day but whether we do the meeting as a standing meeting or a walking meeting or a sitting meeting is in our control and there are clearly health benefits of each of those three or certain instances that you would want to use each of those three So can we advise the individual that actually your 4 o'clock meeting today should become a walking meeting? Can we advise the individual that for you today based on the exercise that you did yesterday or you're about to do today, a cold water immersion or a cold shower will be beneficial because you may not need to do it every day and I certainly don't do it every day, but I do it at specific moments in time. So that's the interesting piece of science which is that we need to appreciate individually because we're just inundated with content and influencers talking about things sometimes they may not have the right credibility to talk about these things that our job therefore as an organization a company is that how can we distill it down to frankly make health every day and make health simple again right it doesn't need to be complicated it's the simplest things in life which lead yield the biggest results so let me pick a few things which uh which which have become almost influencer slash trending topics yeah explain the logic of the ice baths to me <laughs> in all honesty i am a person who's enjoyed having hot showers even yeah. when the temperature outside is 45 degrees growing up mm. um so cold water baths for me is in general something which i'm averse to yeah and now you're saying ice baths are good for me so i just want to understand the the pros that you can get from it So I think the general statement which is fair to make is that we each become too comfortable being comfortable right anthropologically we have grown up over thousands of generations to live life where our body is constantly challenged in fact that is the stimulus for growth right the cessation of growth occurs when the same stimulus is being applied day in and day out and we all see it every single day uh, in any aspect of our lives So if growth has to occur with a challenge then anything which challenges the organism to a point a healthy point something we call hormetic stress i.e. healthy stress is good for the organism so whether it's being exposed to heat hence why people look at the appreciation and benefits of sauna and steam therapies whether it's the immersion in cold water whether it's intermittently fasting and there are many many examples of this each of these have an advantage to the organism because it gives the signal to the body that something is not quite right and it's time for me to heal and repair and prepare myself for a period of time where i may not have access to a b or c condition and that's actually a great growth stimulus for the human condition so when it comes to cold water immersion i mean it's something that has existed like many of these practices for thousands of years right it's interesting that technology is now keeping pace with ancient wisdom but we see it crop up in so many ancient practices as well how it works it's actually quite manif uh quite multiple so um at the basic level the reduction in core temperature is beneficial especially after an acutely stressful event like running a marathon or playing a sports match when your core body temperature naturally rises so you do want to bring that temperature down 
The second thing is that this has a important role to play because when your body is immersed in cold, the vagal tone, i.e. the part of the autonomic nervous system which is responsible for rest and digest, slowing you down, which is the opposite to fight and flight, actually increases its, its tonality, its, 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 uh, its action items. And that is a soothing, recovery, restful period of the body. Science and data is also suggestive that exposure to cold improves your immune system. So that old tale that we've thought about, which is, oh, don't go outside because you're going to catch a cold. Actually, you don't catch a cold from the outside. It probably is actually doing your immune system more good than harm. You're catching a cold because of the other things that are going on around you, mostly probably sitting inside with people in close proximity as virus particles are moving from one side of the room to the other, etc. So the benefits of cold water therapy are important from an inflammation perspective, and we do it a lot with athletes. It's important from a cardiovascular perspective, recovery. It's important from a immune system perspective. Uh, it's got importance, and I, I don't know the last time you did this, but I always find immediately when I'm in that cold water and I get out, my brain is switched on. I am ready to take on anything, right? So suddenly there's a focus and an ability for the mind to be in the moment, mindfully present. So it's an incredibly accessible, available, um, and honestly, one can just train the body. The you know, it's something we can habituate yeah. towards. Yeah. You know what you just said, right? Is that we and you've been talking about how things are connected, and I feel that and and this kind of rings to that is that what you do to your body physically oftentimes wires your brain a certain way, right? It's um could be you know you feel sluggish after having a very heavy meal, um, or the fact that you take a you know when that cold char hits you, you come out you have a lot more focus and, and I know before we, we started recording I, I spoke to you about the fact that I had a bit of a cold a couple of days ago and I went for a run and came yeah. in for a bunch of recordings and I yeah. could really kind of do them well yeah. yeah at some level that connection while we talk about it we don't talk about how seamlessly that flows from one to the other just from how uh, we can be more alert how we can have more focus um, and while even talks about the exercise part of it a lot we discount the the food part of it and the fuel part of it, like you said. And we assume that you can have a heavy meal, but have a cup of coffee right after that, you'll be fine. But that doesn't really last. I, mean, I think the downer that comes post that makes it even worse. So I don't want to touch upon food specifically when it comes to this, because yeah. when you talk about the connection, we, we tend to just think it's exercise, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot more than that. Outside of your brain, the part of the body which has the second highest concentration of neurons is your gut. So much so that it's, it's roughly, I think, a third of the total number of neurons that you have in your central nervous system. So it's a massive collection of neurons that sit inside of your gut. And when you look at the embryological development of all of us as human beings, uh, the gut and the brain actually stems from the same set of structures that then sort of diversify. Uh, they divide and then diversify later as we grow. So there's always been known this appreciation of this connection between what we now call the gut-brain axis. It is not unidirectional, it's bidirectional. So signals are sent up in the same frequency and intensity as signals are being sent down as well. So if there's, if there's a brain inside of our gut, then clearly what we put in the gut is going to affect the brain in our gut, which is, as I just said, direction, bidirectionally going to affect the brain in our, in our head as well. So that's one part of the uh, uh, equation which we, we, can, we can talk more about. The other thing which is really important for people to appreciate is that we are less than 1% human being. If you look at all of the DNA that you and I have in our respective bodies, and we look at the human DNA component, it's less than 1% when we total it with the, the, the DNA of all the other organisms that we are carrying outside or inside of us. We have over 3 trillion microorganisms sitting inside of our gut. We have the same amount approximately on our skin, in our oral pharynx, on any mucosal surface that we have. And that large 99% DNA has a massive role to play on the health that we have as individuals. So much so that from the moment of birth, we see this in children that are born naturally, i.e. a vaginal delivery versus a cesarean section, their microbiomes are fundamentally different. Because imagine the first surface that a child born through C-section touches is the latex glove of a surgeon, 
immediately being put into an incubator, dried off on the mat, and then kept there for a period of time. Whereas for the child coming through the, the canal, they have all of those organisms which come through and typically they're then put onto the mother's chest to, to nurse or sometimes the father's chest as well. So it's a very, very different microbiome signature in someone between. And that's the moment of birth, right? Every time you shake hands with someone, you are exchanging part of your microbiome with the other person uh, around you. So it's not just the fuel, but it's also what's living on you, in you, within you, which is influencing. Because the microbiome's role is to break down that fuel and either produce healthy, good substances like short-chain fatty acids, and tryptophan in its makeup towards serotonin, which is that feel-good hormone, or it produces unhealthy substances, and it can make you feel depressed, it can give you irritable bowel, it can lead to inflammatory bowel disease, um, neurodegenerative disorders, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm glad you touched upon this because I think the appreciation for fuel and just how central a role it plays in our performance in health and longevity is vastly underappreciated in, in everyday life. And so we should each really think about, because we're a machine, you one would never dream of putting diesel in a petrol car, then how can we think about putting a high carb meal into someone that wants to do suddenly deep work? How is that equation gonna work? It's, it's, just, it's just not meant for it, yeah. For me, as I start to focus a lot more on physicality of just like trying to be more athletic, trying to be fitter in life. I feel for me, food came last because at some point in my head mentally, I'm naturally a thin person. So I'm like, and the tendency is that, you know, you only think about being fitter when you have more weight. Um, and for me, it was okay, I'll put on more muscle, which means I can eat more. So suddenly having an extra biryani is not a problem at all. Till I when she sat down and, and really broke it down and saying, Okay, let me just try different things um, and I suddenly switched from let's say a, a whey protein to a plant protein and I suddenly saw a visible difference of feeling I had um, in, in, in my gut. Um, simple things like when when I have my last cup of coffee for instance, right? Um, I'm, I'm thinking technically that is a form of very like basic level biohacking for me. I was experimenting seeing how do different foods and different timings affect that actually brought me to a real personal realization and, 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 and want you to obviously add a lot more uh, to that is that it's not just about what you eat it's about when you eat it and how often you eat it yep. and you, you can maybe afford to have a cheat meal occasionally but you don't feel as nice the next day morning even though you feel very excited to have that cheat meal that day yeah um, but it's also like a, a balance of saying you're not like giving up stuff you're actually gaining stuff and you, you know it often feels like the cheat meal is the reward and the rest of what you eat feels like the work, but it's actually in some ways you have a lot more work to do after you have that cheat meal. So how do you flip that by not making it a negative? Like, you know, you're not holding things back. You're actually gaining things by just looking at your food differently. Well, I think you summarized it really beautifully. I, I, I never like to use the term diet ever because diets are unsustainable. But the minute you have a conversation with someone and hopefully they appreciate, okay, fuel and what fuel means, and therefore, what's the right type of fuel? And you said it correct. It's not the amount. It's it's the when. It's the how much. It's the what. Uh, it's the context. All of those things are are really uh, really important. I did a little bit of an experiment, as I always do. Um, I was wearing one of the glucose patches that we were talking about, and I wear this ring to sleep, the Aura ring as well. And um, a couple of months ago, we decided, like many families, have pizza night for the kids. And so instead of cooking something, we had pizza and ice cream. So I looked at my data overnight and I was shocked to see not only was I hyperglycemic, i.e. my glucose levels were much significantly higher than what it should be over the course of the whole night. But what that affected doing, it raised my resting heart rate. My resting heart rate, typically 46, 48 beats per minute was at 56 beats per minute, and that's a significant extra load that your body is doing. My heart rate variability, which is a stress response, uh, crashed down, so it meant that my body was in a more stressed state, and all attributable to what we thought was a celebration, which is the pizza and the ice cream, right? So it goes exactly to your point. So now, and I think everyone listening should hopefully appreciate that, 
if you're working towards a big moment, let's say you've got a big client presentation or you've got a quarterly earnings reporting call to give or, or you know, a big event, physical event, really look at how you fuel your body for the 72 hours leading up to it. And especially in the worlds where we celebrate burning the midnight oil and ordering that late night takeaway and then having caffeine all the way through the night, thinking this is going to be good for us the next day, we have seen on all metrics of success and scoring, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental, the numbers are significant, significantly depressed. I want to tap to caffeine a little bit because I feel that's a very like, it's the most abused thing if you look at it. Um, in modern work life, especially is that, you know, you have caffeine all night long and then comes obviously you have energy drinks with higher caffeine levels. Um, at which level is it you're using it right and at which level does it become your okay you you're using it as a crutch and then you obviously you're abusing it so i think the first thing for us to appreciate is that most caffeine is is sold to us as sugar if you look at the makeup of any high street available cup of coffee and what the typical individual is consuming through that there is a ridiculously large amount of sugar, which is what people are becoming addicted towards, which has a separate set of health consequences to caffeine. Caffeine at the epidemiological level, i.e. across society, there is a very clear signal towards a health benefit. Between one to two cups of coffee, or not coffee, caffeine every day. That could come as tea or that could come as caffeine. I'm not going to talk about the energy drinks because that's, again, yeah, laden with that's sugar. That's sugar, like that's yeah, the other level, yeah. yeah. So clearly having some caffeine in the day, one to two cups is advantageous at the population level, right? And we see that in all the blue zones. Each of the blue zones, people there, and blue zones for people who are listening, are areas of the world which have a highest probability of you living to be 110 and beyond. Uh, and this was a natural geographic study that was done about uh, 15 or 20 years ago. <coughs> so all of them consume caffeine. Now, the question, therefore, is how does caffeine work? And based on how it works, how should we use it to our advantage beyond the health benefit? So caffeine, apart from being a sort of cardiovascular uh, drug from the health perspective, I it typically probably has a net lowering effect on blood pressure, is that caffeine is a stimulant. And it's a stimulant, therefore, that's why we feel all peppy and energized and, and ready to go. The problem with caffeine is that for most of us who are normal metabolizers of caffeine, and you can check whether you're a slow or a fast metabolizer by doing a simple saliva-based genetic, genetic test, it takes the average person about six hours to clear half of the concentration of caffeine in the bloodstream, which is what we call a half-life. So let's take the average cup of coffee, 120 milligrams of caffeine. Six hours, if say, let's say I have it at 10 a.m., six hours later, so at uh, 4 p.m., I now have 120, half is 60. I have 60 milligrams of caffeine in my bloodstream. Six hours after that, which now takes me at 10 p.m., I now have half of that. I have 30 milligrams of caffeine in my bloodstream, right? So it's very easy to understand then over a few days as you keep having one, especially if you're having that cup of coffee at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., you have basically got super levels of caffeine in your bloodstream even when you're trying to go to sleep. And caffeine very clearly disturbs sleep. We know that, right? So caffeine, if you want to use it, has a very particular window of time that you should use it in. The window is not the first thing you wake up in the morning. And it's for this reason I'm so again. I'm happy you said that. Yeah, and I, I recently wrote an article on this as well. Because what happens is your body loves yin and yangs. So as we want to go to sleep, melatonin levels start to rise, typically from about sunset, 6 p.m. It reaches its highest point around 4, 3, 4 a.m. And that's when we are in our deepest sleep. And then it slowly starts to curtail off as we wake up. In opposition to that, cortisol levels start to rise in the early hours of the night to reach its threshold at between 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning. And then it starts to come down. Anyone who's ever had a blood cortisol test will know. Every doctor across the world will tell you, you have to have it done at 8 a.m. There's no other time that you can do a blood cortisol level. Because that's your highest level. Cortisol is your stress hormone. It what makes you feel alive, feel awake, get fight or flight ready. Why then, when you your body is in its natural state of highest, are you trying to put another stimulant on top? The caffeine will have zero effect. Caffeine has a dependency so we become more dependent so the same dose 
uh, sorry, to get the same effect, you need a higher and higher dose, right? So you're not actually doing your body any net gain. The best time to have caffeine for most people, therefore, is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. As the cortisol level naturally starts to come down and your body needs a little bit of a kick, that's when you can have the stimulus. But it's not too late in the afternoon such that it'll begin to interfere with your nighttime ritual. So that's the sweet spot. So anyone who wants to have a cup of coffee, please, between 10 a.m. and 2 Provided you slept well. Provided you slept well and provided you are a normal metabolizer. If you're a slow metabolizer, then I would actually move that 2 p.m. up to 12 p.m. If you're a fast metabolizer, then you could probably get away with a cup of caffeine at about 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. And it may not affect you in the night. You're either. pushing my last cup of coffee from 4 p.m. now to like 2 p.m. Which is so I've actually moved from a person who would have his last cup of coffee at 6 p.m. now to about 4, 4.30. I think the next thing I want to try is, is can the two... 3 p.m. one be my last cup of coffee. And that's why I think, you know, devices like this ring are really interesting because I go through, like, <clears throat> as we were jokingly speaking about the fact that, yes, I was slightly insane to run a full marathon three days after coming off steroids and antibiotics for pneumonia. In the lead up to that marathon for three weeks, because I was so unwell, I biohacked the crap out of my body. I was literally looking at every single thing I did from each of those five pillars knowing that I really wanted to run this marathon because it meant so much to me and, uh, and optimized everything. And one of the biggest things I did was I just took caffeine out of the equation completely. I love black coffee and I, I use it usually every day to my advantage. But because I needed to optimize recovery, in addition to changing my magnesium salt and really looking at all of my sleep routines, I just cut caffeine out completely. And through the data, I was able to appreciate for myself just how much faster I fell asleep. So the latency period shrunk significantly. And the period of time that I spent in deep sleep, which is where your physical body gets its most restorative capacity, expanded itself, right? So that's why I think these little tiny things can, at the right context, as you were saying, give you that little bit of insight to know, okay, this is something which is useful for me and I'm going to stick to it. I've actually been meaning to ask you this, and this is a totally... I feel like I'm using this opportunity to ask a, a question which I've been kind of battling with in my own head. Is that, is long-term fasting for everyone? Let's say someone like me who tends to lose, I'm, I'm in that minute category of people and I've often been given a lot of grief for this, is then I lose weight a lot easier than I gain. I'm a small subsection of the world who's always told that, but that's an advantage to have. And I'm yeah. like, do you realize how much... I'll have to do to, to put on any form of muscle because yeah. it just goes away. Right? Yeah. Standard joke from all friends is that Varun goes on a holiday and comes back losing weight. Uh, versus everybody else has put on weight. Um, so yes, uh, I'll get more hate because now I put this on record. <laughs> Sound like me. And, and I've always, I've wanted to try out fasting for the longest time. The reason why I stay away from it beyond a certain point is that what if I lose everything that I have yeah. managed to maintain and gain? Is that like, is that almost me thinking of it from a lens that is totally untrue or is there some thought to what I'm saying? How many hours you got? Uh, I could literally talk for hours. <laughs> I know we were joking about length of time. Let me, let me distill it down, right? Uh, the most recent Nature paper that has come out on this subject, which was a review done by Matt Cablin, incredible, incredible brain, uh, works at the University of Washington in Seattle, thankfully on our board as well at Human Edge. Uh, he did a nature review looking at just literally decades of research to identify and understand what is the best form of fasting for the body. And his analysis was very simple. Calorie restriction is the most beneficial thing that organization, uh, organisms at the societal level can do, right? Two very specific words, Organis organisms at the societal level. Organisms, why? Because we've seen that over roughly a billion years of evolution, the same methodology of calorie restriction, whether it's a nematode worm, a C. elegans, a mouse, a drosophila fly, a primate, or now uh, dogs, which are the most recent animals that are being tested before humans, net calorie restriction has led to a health span improvement, i.e. they've lived longer number of years, right? Roughly speaking, that sweet spot seems to be anywhere between 15% to 30%. So a net calorie reduction of 15 to 30% is the most effective thing that we can do at a societal level. The problem with that is that we as a society, our diet, our consumption of fuel has become so poor 
that we need that in order to get the health span effect. If we were eating the truest forms that we should be, uh, locally available, a combination of plant and some animal, uh, roots, nuts, berries, fruits, vegetables, fibers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we probably wouldn't need to have such a big net net deficit. Why? Because again, anthropologically, we have always lived up until the last 70, 80 years in a state of the world where calories were not abundant. Now we can each consume as much calories whenever we want for most of the world, uh, how, however much we want to. So that's why we're saying now that for society, being in a net calorie reduction, if you're unhealthy, if you've got prediabetes, dys dyslipidemias, etc., it'll benefit. So the question then is what to do with people like yourself who are healthy from a metabolic perspective. I'm making some assumptions here. From a metabolic and a cardiovascular health perspective, healthy from a body fat percentage, uh, and just healthy from a habits and behaviors perspective, right? That's the question that people then ask me. So then we need to look at the role of fasting, right? So what is the role of fasting? So if the net benefit or goal is to be calorie restricted, Fasting is just a mechanism. There are many mechanisms. You could eat the same number of meals, but just have fewer amount of calories. You could extend the eating windows and be on one meal a day uh, as a technique. You could do what Walter Longo talks about, which is a fasting mimicking diet, which is you're still eating the same amount of food, but you're just doing it in different ratios. So your calories change through the day. So intermittent fasting is then just as the technique. So we need to then see if it is a technique, what is it about the technique which could potentially have another gain? And the gain comes in a technique or a, a physiological mechanism called autophagy. Autophagy is where your body is given a period of abstinence such that your cells go into a hormetic stress, i.e. they are stressed. They suddenly say, oh, hey, hang on, there's something weird going on. There's no calories coming in. I need to now bunker down and prepare for what could be hibernation winter mm. because that's what yeah. our ancestors used to have in other organisms. And in that process, what it begins to do is it identifies the junk which exists in our cells. It breaks it down and it recycles it and keeps it aside or repairs stuff that should be repaired, right? So that's the benefit. And autophagy means auto, self, phagy, cleaning or eating. So autophagy is a period of time where your body is in this rest state of calorie deficit that it's starting to repair itself and heal itself from the inside out. So it's very difficult to look at a timeline, but one generally sees three specific windows. In the first 14 to 16 hours of a fast, what is most likely happening is your metabolic health is starting to realign itself away from carbohydrates towards learning how to use fat as its primary fuel source, the beta oxidation of fat. And it's where we first begin to see ketones in our bloodstream. Ketones are the purest, cleanest fuel. It is amazing for the heart. It is incredible for the brain. And that's why people who fast often talk about entering the zone where suddenly they're switched on and they can artistically, creatively, imaginatively think and do deep work. That's where ketones are in the bloodstream. So this is happening somewhere between 14, 16, 18 hours. The more metabolically flexible you are, i.e. the better you've trained your body to break fat versus carbohydrate, the earlier that benefit will occur. The next zone happens somewhere around 24 to 36 hours of pure fast, only water. And in this phase of time, something seems to be happening around this autophagy, where your cell signaling recognizes that, okay, there's no calories now coming in at all. I need to start replenishing, cleaning, healing from the inside out. And that's why when you look at some of the more advanced form of fastings across cultures, religions, and spiritual practices, we see these extended periods of time, which are periodic in nature, right? Once a year, twice a year, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a net goal, therefore, of spending some time of a fast, more than 24 hours, somewhere between 24 to 36 hours. And then there is this thought, well, if I take it longer, 48 to 72 hours, what could potentially be happening? And some science suggests that there is a degree of regeneration happening within the stem cells that exist in different parts of the body. Again, it's not proven, it's, it's very theoretical, but there is clearly some type of little advantage. So now when I look at fasting, right, how my wife Ryan and I look at our fasting schedule at home, 
we don't spend as much time in the 12 to 14 hours anymore because we did that through COVID. I was able to achieve a reduction in weight, a redistribution towards muscle, getting rid of visceral fat around the liver, et cetera, which is so dangerous. And I moved from a pre-diabetic state to be metabolically more flexible and optimal, right? So we don't have to do as many of the 12 to 14 hour fast every day. What we do do, however, is that once every six months, we'll do a three-day water-only fast, right? And I was just sharing, it's, it's coming up to that period now where we're, we're going to be doing it. So we just wind down slowly. And in that period of time, that's when you get the longevity benefit. So when someone asks me this question, it's not a simple yes or no, you should, and those, these many hours. It's important to understand the individual's objective, where they are from a health status, where they want to go from a health objective perspective, and then design a plan for them around that. And commonly people say that they give up fasting because they either get a lot of acidity, and that can very well be managed through uh, simple um, uh, over-the-counter medications like a proton pump inhibitor or an antacid. Uh, other, people's feel, other people feel a lot of fatigue, and that's just a natural consequence of your body retraining itself away from carbohydrates. And you can get over that by having water and staying hydrated through the day. Uh, and some people suffer from these terrible migraines. Again, it's the same as giving up smoking or alcohol. It's a withdrawal symptom. And there you can manage that with a little bit of caffeine uh, because black coffee uh, or black tea is completely okay to take, uh, even in a, in a fasting state. The last thing I'll say about fasting is people who want to introduce fasting, don't give up breakfast, give up dinner. Your body's clock is best optimized for your fasting window to be that last meal in the day. And again, there's a lot of wisdom, and my wife comes from a Jain family, about how they say you eat when the sun rises and you stop eating when the sun sets precisely the same when it comes to fasting. Unfortunately, in society, we've taken the converse and we'll have a late dinner, a heavy dinner, a terrible dinner, go to bed thinking, okay, that's my meal. And then we'll wake up in a stress state, cortisol is high, caffeine being pumped down the system. And then thinking, I'm going to skip breakfast. Actually, you're doing more inflammation to your body than you are doing good. So if you are going to try fasting, extend your eating window at the night and have a nice healthy breakfast in the morning. You know, I'd like you said, how many hours do you have? And I, I think we can go longer into that. But what I want to do is I want to try out fasting okay. before I get you back on the podcast. Yep. So that the next time we do this, and I'm, I'm, I'm already pretty sure there's going to be a, a next time in my head for me to kind of pull you back, <laughs> make the long trek to the studio to do this. Sure. Um, I need a biohack for that. <laughs> <laughs> a biohack for that to get through Bombay traffic. Yeah. Um, what's become a trend on the show is if you kind of leave the show at a point saying oh, people want more, so make sure that you kind of make them wait for the guests to come back. But I want to close things off by asking you one thing is that you worked across many of, I mean, you, you worked with everyone from astronauts to people in the Air Force, to you, you worked at the front line. Um, across all of these things, if you had to pick one piece of advice, I know it's a, it's a, it's a tough one to say that, what do you see the common, oftentimes you look at people who are high performers in their fields, versus someone who feels that they're living a regular life. What do you feel is the best piece of advice in just human performance that a regular person can take from high performance, which you've seen across, I mean, you're going to the Arctic. Uh, so, yeah, in two months. Uh, yeah. In two months. So I'm like, I have to ask you, like, what can someone who just lives a regular day-to-day -day life take from high performance like that? Find purpose in your work. That is the key. Um, I know listeners were probably expecting me to say something about physical biology or genetics and epigenetics, et cetera. But what I found is, and I choose the words find purpose, not create, or rather create purpose in what you're doing, is that um, that is what keeps you sticky. It's the grit, it's the resiliency. The reason I'm going to the Arctic is precisely looking at mental resiliency in extreme environments with a group of, of leaders uh, as an exercise around that, right? And Whenever we find purpose or create purpose in any task, as simple as a writing assignment to washing the dishes to doing, doing practically anything, that suddenly gives us a capability to make it to the finish line and do it with a smile at the end. Um, so that's what I would say is, is the answer, in my opinion. I think that's a great way to kind of close this episode of thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for A, taking the, making the trek here. My pleasure. Thank um, you. <laughs> and um, secondly, for, for sharing everything that you shared and, 
and and i feel for a lot of people who are watching or listening to this it's going to be one of those episodes you kind of go back to specific parts to kind of um almost like run through uh, these points and thank you for also i mean i i thank anyone who's worked in the front line saying what you did during uh the, the time of covid-19 and um, yeah and thank you and hope to have you back soon so we can tap into maybe fasting a lot more once yeah. i've tried it out myself very good very good my pleasure thank you for having me today varun thank you <laughs>